Gideon Rack, thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thanks for having me. When did it strike you that the subject of what happens to prisoners of war after they return home would be a rich subject for drama? Well, um, what really amazed me is that Israel is such a tight community and such a small country and we all go to the army and we all fight for the return of prisoners of war and nobody knows what happens to them the minute they're back. And I was very curious as to why that is and that's why I started exploring it and researching it and finding a world of drama that hasn't been tapped into. A few moments ago, a Red Cross airplane carrying the Israeli prisoners of war has landed. The Prime Minister is on her way to greet them. Then they will be united with their families. I ask that you kindly respect their privacy in the following days and weeks. <laughs> Is nobody um, familiar with that? You'd think there'd be intense interest in what happens to prisoners of war when they come back. Well, I think one of the answers, it's, it's really, it's a complicated question, but one of the things is uh, we need a happy ending. Israelis pay such a high price for the return of prisoners of war. We campaign for the return. We go out to the street. We demand that our government pays a high price. And then we want a happy ending. And the truth of the matter is that for nobody coming back from captivity uh, waits a happy ending. Usually it's the beginning of a very hard journey to reacclimate and to rehabilitate themselves and, and to find their place in, in society again. And many of them don't. Um, and I think that's part of it. Uh, the other part is that the former prisoners of war coming back home uh, usually dive straight into anonymity. There's a lot of shame uh, uh, that, that comes with uh, being a, prisoners of, a prisoner of war and especially with the price they pay for their return. You know, Gilad Shalit, who came back after five years uh, with Hamas, he came back a few years ago. Uh, there was just a terror attack uh, in Israel a few weeks back and I opened the paper and I saw that the reporter said that the people who did this terror attack were released in the deal to bring him back home. And I was thinking what a horrible burden to carry on, this, on, on his shoulders. So it's no wonder that some of them just want to disappear. What sort of research did you do with former prisoners of war about their experiences? Well, uh, what I was really interested in, I spoke to many, to dozens of, of former prisoners of war, um, but then I spoke to their wives as well, and to their daughters and, and sons, and to their families, their siblings, and I found that the term prisoners of war actually applies to all of them, and maybe even to all of us uh, uh, as a country in Israel. Um, I also talked to psychologists who treat them, doctors who treat them, because very interestingly, uh, prisoners of war have very severe post-traumatic stress disorder that is completely different from any other PTSD, but very similar in uh, other groups of captives around the world, Chinese prisoners of war, uh, Koreans, uh, American, um, even the same physical diseases uh, uh, attack them. So it was a very interesting uh, uh, research period, and, and uh, I made some friends for life. The main themes of the Israeli show Prisoners of War and the American version Homeland are the same, but beyond that, they're quite different. Yes. For example, in Homeland, you know, the Claire Danes character is the lead, but in Prisoners of War, that's a secondary character. The Brody character in Homeland is an amalgam of several characters in Prisoners of War. Why those changes? Well, you know, when, when I came to adapt the show to uh, the American audience, it was about seeing what's applicable and what not applicable for the American audience. Like I said before, prisoners of war is a huge issue in Israel. We all talk about it all the time. It's, it's headline news. But in America, most of my friends who are very educated and very, uh, uh, you know, they read a lot, they're very political, they're very involved, none of them knew before Bo Bargdell came back uh, uh, from captivity after four years with the Taliban, none of them knew that he was held there. It's just not something that you discuss uh, on a national level in America. So we were thinking, my, my uh, fellow producers and me, how to uh, take the investigation and make it the main engine of the show. And uh, finding an unreliable character like Carrie uh, and following her into this investigation seemed to be the right way to do it. What prompted Sergeant Brody, my name is Carrie Matheson. I served as a case officer in Iraq. It's good to meet you in person. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry we were unable to find you sooner. 
I appreciate that. As you know, the first 72 hours after Soldier's capture are critical. What he knows can be used by the enemy during that period to devastating effect. The point is, Sergeant Brody stopped being a source of actionable intelligence fairly quickly, and yet he was kept alive for almost eight more years. I'd like to ask him if he knows why. I often wondered that myself. The Homeland pilot alone cost more than both seasons of Prisoners of War. Absolutely. <laughs> is more money good or is it paralysing to have the array of choices that that opens up? You know, I don't think it opens much um, a lot of choices. I think at the end of the day, both industries... Uh, the very poor one in Israel and the very rich one in America suffer from not enough money and not enough time at the end of the day. Um, but the fact that we have almost no money to create TV shows in Israel makes creators think very creatively on how to tell a story. And I think that's why you see a lot of these formats now traveling uh, across seas to Hollywood. Um, I think uh, having no limitations is actually a big limitation uh, sometimes, yeah. Israel is a country that a lot of people around the world who've never been to Israel have an opinion about. Oh, yeah. Do you think that people understand the reality of life in Israel very well? Absolutely not. I think, uh, uh, first of all, there's, there's a lot of judgment uh, about Israel. Um, some of it is, is right and some of it isn't. I think in order to understand Israel, you should visit in Israel, um, even just to see the sheer size of the place. I think because it's such a, you know, such a, on, on everybody's headline all the time, uh, people think that it's a, a, a huge country. But the truth is that it's a very small country and we all live together, Arabs and Jews and, and secular Jews and Orthodox and Ethiopians. Ethiopians and Russians, and it's such a mix of tribes, and uh, on one hand, such an amazing uh, uh, democracy with freedom of speech respected more than even in the United States. Um, and on the other hand, there's stuff that our government does that uh, uh, you can be critical of, of course. Um, but I think it's probably one of the most or the least understood places on earth. Gideon Raff, very interesting to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.